This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. So example six is a comprehensive example. It's Zeta. You've got two balance sheets, sorry, statements of financial position. You've got one comprehensive income statement. This will normally be shown. He has asked a question which was backwards. He said, this is the cash flow. Unfortunately, the directors have lost the final balance sheet. They've lost the final accounts. Can you prepare the balance sheet from the cash flow? You had last year's figures. We have the cash flow statement. Can you go back and prepare as far as you are able, and so far as you are able, can you prepare the financial statements for this year? So it was a sort of backwards cash flow question. And it tested your appreciation of how the cash flow statement is made up. It tells you what the cash is. It told you what the opening position was. Therefore, what was the closing position? And there's one example, I think it's P2, might actually be F7, where the cash flow is prepared by the chief accountant. The figures that he gives you are in millions. And at the end of the cash flow statement, which had been prepared by the chief financial officer, there was a positive cash flow of 1,631 million. And just about every figure in that cash flow was wrong. The question said it doesn't agree with the company's own records and the bank, which says that the bank balance is in fact 257 million. It was 1.4 billion dollars wrong. And the chief financial officer of this multi-billion dollar enterprise is asking you, at F7, to tell him where he's gone wrong. Which is a, a strange type of question. But can you have a look at Zeta and prepare a cash flow for Zeta?
Okay. PBT is a place to start. Two of you got that wrong. Now, how's that possible? How's that possible? When it says profit for the year before tax, it says profit before tax. Really is no excuse for that. 723. Now, it always seems to me that when I'm doing this, it always seems that you start with profit before tax and then you work your way back up to operating profit. That's what it seems like. So the loss on the disposal of the asset would typically be shown within the, on the face of the statement of income. Um, the interest charge would be shown as a finance charge. The investment income would be... So it always seems to me that you work your way back up. You clearly don't because between operating profit and um, profit before tax, you'd have things like admin expenses and distribution costs. But those are actually included within the figure cost of sales and expenses. So I'm going to work my way back up to get to operating profits. I'm going to add back the interest charge of 110. And that gets me back up to operating profit. Now I know I'm going to have to take off amortization and depreciation and the loss on the disposal of the asset and then I'm going to have to take off tax dividends and interest paid. I know I'm going to have to do the changes in working capital. So I know all of those are going to go up here. So let's do the depreciation. Now this is, this is a little bit upsetting for me because some of you have just got that far and then you stopped. You say, I can't work out the depreciation. Leave it. It's one mark. So many other easy ones to go for. Just leave it. When I did it, while you were doing it, when I did it on, on, on my screen, this is the last figure I calculated. Not worth it. It's only 1.8 minutes for this one. So I'm not going to do the depreciation. I'm going to leave it. Amortization, I know that's going to come in. One of you asked me what amortization was. Why do we amortize intangibles and we depreciate tangibles. Well, because the, the value of a tangible asset depreciates, declines over a period of time, whereas an intangible asset dies. And amortization comes from the French word mort, which means death. So your intangible assets die over a period of time. They lose value because like me and John, we're dying over a period of time. We're being, um, well, so were you, but I didn't want to say this. But we're all being amortized over our estimated useful life. And some of us are nearer the end of our estimated useful life than, than others. So that's why it's amortization, because an intangible is dying, whereas a depreciation simply represents a fall in value or the use of an asset over a period of time. But that's never been asked at FSEB. He's never said, why do we amortize intangibles and we depreciate tangibles? And we impair others like goodwill. Amortization, add back 43. Now I know also there's a loss on disposal as well. So I'll deal with that. Loss on disposal was um, 6. Well, one of you, be very careful, one of you put 6,000 there, because he says in the note it's 6,000 loss on disposal. I'm thinking to myself, the biggest figure in this <laughs> cash flow is 723 profit before tax, and suddenly I've got a loss on disposal of 6,000. So just be careful you get the, the unit of currency right. I've got four marks so far on the screen. I've done no work. I've done nothing. Four marks there. Okay, I'm going to have a look at the, um, the notes here. Intangible non-currents represent deferred development. Amortization is 43. But we can see that they have moved from 817 to 1415. So I'm going to start a new section down here, Investing Activities. And I've got Purchase of INCA. Now, sing out, if I say anything, if I put a figure down and you can't see where it comes from, I'll do the working for it, but you tell me if you can't see where it comes from and then I'll explain it maybe slower, whatever. 
I did have 817, and I've amortized those by 43. So that brings that down to 774. And I finished with 1415. Which means I've spent 681 purchase of INCA. Seven seven four. Not six hundred and eighty one. Six four one. Fourteen fifty eight. Yep. Six four one. And that deals with point number one. Point number two tangible non current asset additions. Oh that's easy then, isn't it? Purchase of TNCA, per the question, 200. Proceeds were 103. One of you managed to make that 106. Why? Proceeds of sale, 103. That's cash in. And we suffered a loss of six. If I received 103 and I suffered a loss of 6, what was the carrying value before I sold it? I'll give you two choices here. It was 97 or it was 109. Which one do you want? Natalie. 109, yeah. It had a carrying value of a 109. I sold it for 103, so I suffered a loss of 6. Well, we'll need that for the depreciation calculation, but I'm leaving the depreciation. It's too difficult. Investments include treasury bills of 32, acquired during 2004. Zeta sees these as cash equivalents. About half the room failed to realize that this is a cash equivalent. This is down at the bottom of the statement. It's cash and cash equivalents carried forward. I can't go down to the bottom because I don't really know how much space I've got. I don't have a sheet of A4 in front of me. I mean, I could if I was silly. I could go all the way down there onto page 9, but, but that would be silly. So I can't do my bottom three figures because I don't know where to write them. But 32,000 investment in treasury bills. One of you, and I won't identify which one, decided that investments in the financial position statement was investment income. Now you know that can't be right. These are assets on the statement of financial position. And we started with 125, and we finished with 396. But actually, 396 is only 364, because 32 of that 396 is cash. So I've got purchase of investments. And I've gone from 125 to... 364. So I must have spent... So I must have spent 239. And that deals with paragraph 3. Paragraph 4, we've got a share issue, a bonus of 1 for 4, coming out of share premium, and then a further issue at full price. Now, I'm going to do a little working for that. Brought forward 300. Brought forward premium, 284, and I've got a bonus issue of 1 for 4. So there were 75 new shares coming out of share premium. So 
So now I'm up to 375 and I'm down to 2109. And I have carry forward figures of 500 and 312. So I must have issued 125 at a premium of 103. So my share issue proceeds are 228. That's in financing activities. I don't have a space for financing at the moment. I'll just create one. Okay. In fact, I can now do cash net cash flow for year. I'll do it while I'm down here. Cash and equivalent brought forward. Cash and equivalent carried forward. Cash and equivalent brought forward straight from the last year's statement of financial position. Brought forward is 81. And carry forward is 17 plus the 32, which gives me 49. So I have a net cash flow this year of negative 32. But that then deals with all the notes. The only thing I have to remember is when I'm calculating the depreciation, I need to remember note number two. But otherwise, the notes are dealt with. So let's get back onto the face of the, the statements of financial position. I've dealt with the intangible assets. This is the way I would do it in the exam. I've dealt with the intangible assets. I've not dealt with the intangibles, so I'll leave those for a minute. Current assets, inventory, receivables, investments, cash... Well, they're up here, aren't they? They're up here. A change in working capital. I've got a decrease in inventory. Is that cash in or out? It's in. A decrease in inventory, 82. I've got an increase in receivables, and this is how I would write it. I have an increase in receivables of 32. Is that in or out? It's out. Payables, a little bit of a problem, and I didn't mention it earlier, but if you look in current liabilities, I've got interest payable, dividends payable, tax payable, trade payables. It's the working capital, it's the trade payables that we're looking at. I'm not going to compare 925 total current liabilities with 936 total current liabilities because I deal with the interest and the dividends and the tax. I deal with those separately. So I'm only going to be looking at trade payables. And I have a decrease in payables of 12. In or out? Out. Okay, back up to current assets. Inventory I've now dealt with, receivables I've dealt with, investments I've already dealt with, and cash is at the bottom, so that's also finished. Equity shares, I've dealt with them. Premium, I've done that. Oh, revaluation account. Need to remember that when I do my depreciation calculation. Retained earnings. Don't look at it. We've dealt with the retained earnings exchange with a 723. 720. Why is that not what it is? 402. Why is it that? Oh, because of the dividends and the tax. All right. So we've dealt with the retained earnings movement by taking 723 and then by dealing with the dividends and the tax as separate exercises. Provision for a court case. I'll show you a T account. Now, 
brought down a provision, 50. Carry down, the provision is 73. So brought down this year is 73. The difference is 23. Where's the double entry? Income statement. Okay. Now show me where I've written cash on there. There's no cash. There's no cash movement. It's a non-cash item. So I need to add this back as well. It's been taken out of income statement. So I've got a movement in the provision of 23. Add back. It has been deducted and arriving at 723. It has been deducted as an expense. I need to add it back because it's not cash. 5% debentures have changed. This is financing. It's gone from 88 to 220. It's a, a change of 132. In or out? It's in, yeah. I've issued some pieces of paper and people have given me money. I just, just hand it out. We call them, another word for a, a loan like this, another abbreviation that we use in the UK is the abbreviation of an IOU. They're called IOUs because it stands for I-O-U. I-O-U money. So we call it an IOU. But officially, for companies, they're called debentures. So we dealt with that. We're into current liabilities. We've got this last threesome in, in the operating activities. Tax paid. Divs paid. Interest paid. Tax paid. Think of it logically. Just get down to basic logic. I did owe 226 at the end of last year. As a result of this year's activities, I owe another 240. So if I had paid everything, I would have paid 466. But I haven't paid everything. I still owe 238. So I therefore must have paid 228. Dividends paid, I did owe 140. I've increased that by this year's dividend of 81. So if I had paid my dividends up to date, I would have paid 221, but I know I haven't, I still owe 81, so therefore I must have paid 140, in or out. Yeah, these last three tax dividends and interest paid, just think about those. I mean, occasionally you'll get a tax repayment, but it is occasional. Dividends paid, it's got to be in brackets. You can't have dividends re being received from your shareholders. Do you not think it's time you paid me a dividend, you say to your shareholders? It just cannot be. So a dividend payment is always going to be an outflow. The same with interest paid, unless you've got a very friendly lender who not only lends you money but then also pays you interest. Happening in the UK at the moment, some people have got mortgages on their homes where the mortgage interest rate is fixed as a, an amount 2% um, less than the London Interbank official rate. Well, the London Interbank official rate is getting down to about 2%, about 2.5%, I think, or 2.25% at the moment. And if you've got a mortgage at 2% less than that official rate, you're paying mortgage interest of half a percent. What happens when the London Interbank rate gets down to one and three quarter percent? It means the interest rate that you're being charged on your mortgage is negative quarter of a percent. This means in theory that the lender is going to start paying you a monthly amount by way of your mortgage interest. 
Well, there's a little bit of panic in the financial world in the UK at the moment with reference to these interest rates, which are two fixed at 2% less than the London interbank rate. A little bit of panic going on. But interest payable... I started with 30 owing, and the year's charge is 110. I should have paid 140. But I know I haven't, because I've still got 100 outstanding. Therefore, I must have paid 40. We're nearly done. Uh, what else do I have to do? Not much, I don't think. Just depreciation. The depreciation calculation. I started my tangible non-current assets for 681. And I've sold... A hundred and nines worth. So they're now actually 572 that I started with and I still have. And then I looked at these assets and thought, I better buy some. So I bought 200 more. That gets me up to 772. And some of these look really attractive assets. What I'm going to do is revalue them. My revaluation has gone from 40 to 150. I've revalued by 110. That gets me to 882. Those are the assets which I started with and still have. And then I bought some more and revalued some. So my figure on the statement of financial position, I'm hoping it's going to be 882. Ah, it's not. It's only 832. Surely I must have depreciated by 50. Depreciation 50. It's an add back. Now, there are two schools of thought with reference to this next bit. When you're doing a statement of financial position, question one, the consolidation. When you're doing a statement of financial position, where are the marks? Where are the marks? I told you on Monday. Where will you earn the marks? In the workings. Yeah. The fact that you can transfer the figures from the workings to a statement of financial position, well, they've actually given that exercise to a, the troop of chimpanzees in Frankfurt Zoo, and they managed, some of them actually managed to, to do that transfer properly. So it shouldn't be a problem, should it? Transferring assets, transferring figures from workings to a statement of financial position. How many marks do you think there are for adding up your statement of financial position? For proving to the marker that you're able to press the right buttons on your calculator. How many marks are there for adding up a statement of financial position? Uh, none. Okay. If there are no marks, why do it? If there are no marks available for adding it up, why add it up? Oh, to be sure that you haven't made a mistake. That you may have missed something. And you think that you won't miss something? Are we feeling so confident about working 5B, working 3? And Are we so confident that we're not prepared at this stage to accept that a mistake will be made? Well, you make one mistake, your balance sheet won't balance. So why add it up? Personally, I would do. I would do, for the reason that you're saying there, Natalie, 
If I have made a mistake, it may be an obvious one. And I showed you yesterday how to find mistakes. You look for the actual figure. You look for the figure divided by 2. You look for the figure, does it divide by 9? You look, is it 1, 10, 100, 1,000 now? I went through this yesterday. So only by adding it up can you quantify your error. But once you've quantified it, then you can start doing this error detection process. But if you've run out of time, don't even do that. If I had the time in the exam, I would add it up. Just to see how much I'm wrong, can I see any mistakes very quickly and easily. But if I've not got the time, I wouldn't. And it's up to you now to make your own strategic decision. If there are no marks for adding up, are you going to add up? That's up to you. But I'm telling you, in this exercise, don't. Don't add it up. I'll tell you why. I'll show you why. I'll use this as an example. I'll use this investing activities as an example. Uh, six, seven. Uh, three, seven. One, nine. Nine seventy seven negative. What have I gained by adding that up? Nothing. What if I've made a mistake? What have put proceeds from TNCA sale 109? Or 97? What if I've got the wrong figure in? Then that is wrong. And you've got a figure up there from operating activities, and you've got a figure down here from financing activities. <laughs> Adding it up wrong. 360. And the marker, bless him, has got the ability to just look down this extreme column and say, yes, that's right, 977 is right, 360 is right, the bottom figures are right. But what if you've made a mistake? You're then actually pointing out to the marker that you've made a mistake. You're saying, look, I've made a mistake, don't know where it is, don't know what it is, it's up to you to find it, but I've made one. And you're telling him that you've made it. So don't put your addition figures in. He knows that's right. He knows that's right. You can see those are right. He can see these individual ones up here. He can see that these are right. By all means, add it up. But put your subtotals on your question paper until it balances, until it does come down to 32 negative. And then put your total figures in. But otherwise, don't do it. Can you add that up for me? 883, 993, 993, 593, 595. Now, hopefully, this will add up. 585.977 is 392, 390, yes. All right. What was difficult about 723? For most of you. What was difficult about that? Nothing. Where's the problem with the adding back the interest charge? What about amortization given to you? Six loss on sale given. Changes in inventory, receivables, and payables. No problem. 
you might not have known, you might not have realized without the movement on the provision. All right, not a big deal. Tax paid, did anyone get that wrong? Interest paid, dividends paid, did anyone get that wrong? You shouldn't have done. You might have done, but probably next time you won't. 641, awkward. No, it wasn't Inca, it was straightforward, 641, wasn't it? 641 for the development expenditure. That should have been relatively straightforward. 200 was given, 103 was given. Purchase of investments, okay, you missed the 32. Watch out for cash equivalents in the exam. Share issue should not have been a problem. Two marks for that. How do I explain? Um, like I like I did do there. The funny thing, really, you know, that where a share issue, where a bonus issue is financed by share premium, shares plus premium is 584 shares plus premium is 812 difference 228 all I'm doing is moving that 75 so in fact there's no change is there in shares plus premium, if I had if I had three seven five and two oh nine, I get five hundred and eighty four, which is this figure. So there's no change if I'm financing the issue out of share premium. But and I don't know, but there could very well be a mark for that and a mark for that. It could be that when they're doing the marking scheme, if you're going to show the share issue proceeds and the premium separately, like I have done here, then there could be a mark each. If you don't, and you get the right answer, then you can presume, I assume, that you got both marks. But I wouldn't. I would, I would actually show it as 125 plus 103. That's what I would do. 132, there shouldn't have been a problem with that either. The movements in the debentures shouldn't have been a problem. And certainly these bottom three, apart from the, that 32, that shouldn't have been a problem. So... I told you at the start, it's basically one mark per figure that you get right. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. That's seventeen there. And there's really not been any effort. There's been, seriously, no effort. So what's the key? The key is, take me into the exam room with you. But they wouldn't allow that. The key is, practice. Just get used to it. Get used to looking and knowing where to look for the movements, knowing how the movements happen. One of the comments that the marker and the examiner regularly make, it's no good just having a list of figures. So you really ought to make an effort to, to put them in the right place, to into operating, into investing, into financing. That really is quite important, because that's where it should be if you were doing it in practice. So the segregation and the separation and the classification is important. And clearly brackets are important. You need to get used to how to determine is it in brackets or not. 
But there's no importance about the sequence within the section. That's not important. Presentation, layout. Many, many, many easy marks. If this came up as a cash flow 25 marker, if it comes up and it comes up more often than it doesn't, I'm expecting all of you to pass. You should sensibly, realistically, realistically be looking at scoring around 20 in a consolidation question. And if cash flow comes up, I've got another 20 lined up for you. It's then going to be rather difficult. If you scored 40 out of 50, it's got to be a conscious effort not to get 10 more out of 60, out of the remaining 50. You've got to sit there and say, I'll prove Mike wrong. I'll not score 10 marks out of this next 50. And if you'll do those many exercises, you'll get your 10 marks there in question two. Without doubt, probably 20 marks in question two, if you'll do the many exercises, which I keep asking you to do. You've got a realistic chance of picking 60 marks up out of the first 75 within the time allocation. Do not spend longer because you've still got 45 more minutes to pick up marks in the 15 and the 10 marks. This exam, success in this exam, is within your reach if you'll do the many exercises. Right. It could be, as it was this last June, it could be that the question, question three, is a cash flow and an interpretation. Interpret that for me very quickly. Just interpret that for me. We're generating 585 from our operating. Nowhere near enough to finance our investing activities. But, having said that, much of the investing activities is in the development expenditure area. And presumably, we'll reap the benefits of this development expenditure in the future years where the item that we're developing now goes on stream onto the market. We've spent 641000 developing this intangible non-current asset. When that starts to, to generate income, generate profits for us, then we'll get the benefit of it. We can expect this top section, 585, to be much improved when we start marketing this matter which we've been developing. So, all right, we can continue. So long as we're not forced with having to sell any of our TNCA, well, yeah, you can sell 109's worth in the normal course of events. You can sell 109. So long as we're not having to sell our manufacturing uh, facility. We're not having to, to sale and lease back, for instance, our um, head office. So long as we're able to continue to uh, keep our investments. But we can. You know, we spent 239 buying investments. If that hadn't happened, we would have had a positive cash flow at the end. We we're only 32 down despite the fact that we spent 641 and 239, 880,000 on buying presumably non-productive assets. So we're not doing too badly, even though we're on negative cash flow. But we've only generated 585 from operating. We've got 977 luxury investment in non-necessaries. So that has to be financed by the issue. Well, clearly our shareholders are quite confident. We've had an issue at full market price, which was uh, properly subscribed. Not at full market price, not only at, at face value, but we actually got a premium from the shareholders as well. So that would indicate that they're prepared to buy, for 228, they're prepared to buy $125 worth of shares. That's an indication of confidence from our shareholders. Even the lenders. The lenders are happy to lend us money. There's no indication of whether the debentures are secured or not. They probably will be. Uh, so in the event that we do fail to pay, then our debenture holders will have the security of our assets. It's interesting to see 132 debentures and we've got 110's worth of loan interest. It uh, doesn't seem to tie in. If I were an auditor, I'd be a little bit worried on an analytical review basis. 110 interest on, a, on, on 220 debentures. 
5% of 220 is 11. 11, not 110. Where's the rest gone? So there seems to be something wrong with the, the inherent relationship of those figures. But we managed to persuade investors to lend us or invest in us another 360, and that's reduced the negative impact down to 32. We're still positive. We've got 32s with the cash investments, and we've still got 17,000 in the bank, so we've still got positive cash. It's not as though we're insolvent. We're not looking at disaster scenario. And so long as the directors keep a control of their expenses and keep an eye on the development expenditure and realize the investments if necessary, release the money tied up in those investments, as long as we keep an eye on that, then we should be okay for at least the next year. And then the development expenditure will kick in and start generating profits. Chat, 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 chat. Come on, what was deep about that? What was really perceptive about that? Blah, 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 blah. Well, you can do that. I've been listening to you for the last three days. Blah, 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 blah. You can do. Confidence, self-confidence, that's all it is.